You are listening to the SDSU podcast presented by the East Village Times with your hosts Andre Hagberdian and Paul Garrison. Welcome, listeners, to episode 130 of the SDSU Podcast. I am Andre Hackberry, and we'll be joined shortly by my co-host, Paul Garrison. In today's episode, we interview safeties coach CJ Magorisk. Magorisk came with defensive coordinator Eric Schmidt from Washington this past season. When Sean Lewis hired Schmidt to be his defensive coordinator, as you will hear the story from Magorisk, Schmidt asked him to come along with him to San Diego, come down the West Coast from Northern West Coast to Southern West Coast and be a part of what they're building in San Diego. Magoris is originally from Michigan. And as you will hear kind of his story, he describes also, I would highly recommend you guys, if you haven't already, to read the article that Paul Garrison wrote on CJ Magoris at eastvillagetimes.com that kind of went into a little bit of his backstory in Michigan. Uh, I highly recommend that. Uh, let's get into the interview with Coach, and then Paul and I will be back at the end to give our final takeaways. We want to welcome CJ Magorisk to the podcast. It's SDSU Safeties Coach. How are you doing today, Coach? I'm doing well. Great to be on. Great Thank to you be for on. the time, as always. You know, of all the opportunities in the coaching world, you chose San Diego State and, and Sean Lewis. You know, what brought you here? Uh, You know, me and Coach Schmidt worked together for the last two years up at University of Washington. So when Coach Lou offered him the the defensive coordinator job, he asked me if I wanted to come down and coach the safeties. Um, And I was, you know, like, that's an unbelievable opportunity. Why why would you not want to come down to San Diego State, a place where it's it's a great place to live, it's a great school, and there's great tradition. And then – you know, getting a chance to talk with Coach Lou and listen to his philosophy, kind of how he envisions a program and how he wants to run it. I mean, it's a no brainer when you're when you got the ability to work at a great program with great people. Thing, you know, the world is a uh, it's an easy choice. Absolutely. Your previous uh, stops, you know, you were a grad assistant, you're a quality control uh, analyst last year, but this is your first position coach role. You know, what excites you about, you know, getting this opportunity to coach safeties? Yeah, you know, it's a it's a it's a blessing to be able to, you know, you build a little different relationship with the guys when you're the one up there teaching and you're recruiting the guys that are coming into the program. Um, You know, so I think that piece is the biggest uh, step forward. Um, Not that you're not building relationships with guys and spending time with them, you know, in the roles that I was in, but it's a little met less where you're the one meeting with them and sitting down with them and talking about things versus doing some of the stuff um, in the back end, you know? That makes sense. And, and, you know, but there's, there's always a difference, I think in life to, between seeing something even up close um, and then actually doing it. Is, is there anything that's maybe surprised you um, or something that you didn't think you'd have to emphasize that you have to emphasize even in just the short period? Uh, you know, when you're, uh, it's a little different in terms of when you get cut loose and you get to start really coaching on the field. Um, you know, when you're in that analyst role, you're kind of handcuffed a little bit the way that the NCA structured. So you get to kind of bring your own life into the practice in terms of running around, bringing some juice. So that's been great. Um, from that standpoint, mixing and matching, dealing with, uh, you know, the substitutions and whatnot, where, you know, I didn't necessarily have to worry about that. You're a little more worried about, some of the the back end data and all that stuff during the practice um, and correcting things on the fly is a little bit different, which is, you know, it's a lot of fun. It's what you sign up for. Yeah, no, absolutely. And and um, as you're thinking about those things in practice and with as fast and as up tempo as everything is, um, has it ever been any part of a challenge to, you know, you can't really stop and you can't really go because they're going, go, 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 go. Um, ha- has that been like an adjustment at all? Uh, you know, I've, I've been lucky enough to see some, some up-tempo offenses, uh, in the past, Mm -hmm. um, where you kind of get used to it. You're definitely going to have to coach on the film, which is great. Um, you know, 
Coach Lou and, and the offensive guys here, that Aztec fast uh, mindset is definitely faster than um, some that I'm used to, uh, even, even with seeing tempo in the past, where the thing that trains the guys, I think, is like you've got to work your cycle of the sap so quickly where you got to get the call, understand the D&D, &D, see the formation and know your job. Um, where you're going to correct it. You're not going to be screaming at them as the play's going on because the next thing you know, it's it's next play, one and no mentality. Um, but then you can correct that on the film um, and you're pushing such a pace that, you know, when you see it in the game, when we get to the season, then, you know, you can't be out-tempoed is, is how, uh, how we look at it. As you look back over, you know, your time leading up to, you know, becoming this position coach, who are some of the people who've coached you um, and what were some of the influences and things that they brought to you? Yeah, um, so I was I was very fortunate to learn uh, at the University of Michigan under Coach Greg Madison, um, who was a veteran coach, and just kind of how he ran the room, his approach to guys, understanding ways to teach different guys um, was huge. And then in addition to that, uh, his assistant, Joe Hastings, uh, who's with the Colts now, he was a guy that I leaned on in terms of connecting with different guys. And then from there, Fresno State, uh, the team up north, you know, um, was there for a couple of seasons and, and learned under Coach Jamar Kane, which was unbelievable. Because um, same thing, you're, you're in a different area of the country, you're learning different personalities and how you're coaching and how you're adapting guys um, is gonna change, you know, individual to individual. Um, and then up at UW, you know, Coach Schmidt with the edges, seeing how he approached things. Uh, Coach Chuck Morrell, how he approached the safeties. Um, you know, it's really e each coach, I think you just take little bits and pieces uh, from them. And then you use your own personality on things and kind of mold different ideas and different things you've learned all together. You know, we've had the opportunity to talk to a lot of different coaches and a lot of different sports and, you know, coaching philosophy comes up, you know, as you just talked about things you've taken from other people, as you starting your coaching journey, you know, have you had a chance to develop that philosophy or, or, and if so, you know, what, what it entails that? Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, you know, I think it's an, it's an ever changing thing. You're going to have your pillars, right? So, you know, the first thing I'm looking for with guys and the first thing that I want is, is competitors. Like, you want, you want guys in your room that are going to compete with whatever their competition is. And then I think in today's day and age, the biggest thing is competing with yourself. You know, I think it get lost in the shuffle with how you can compare yourself uh, to different players across social media when really like, I'm just asking you to be the best you every single day and just continue to stack days. Um, and then in addition to that, you know, I think not only being a competitor, but being mindful and being present where you are, you know, I think, Again, in today's day and age, you got to be where your feet are. And it doesn't matter if it's the game of football or if it's work, life, like be where your feet are, be present, and then stay in the moment and enjoy the process. And then the last piece, you know, would be joy. I think that also gets lost is, you know, this game is fun. Like it, it is unbelievable to walk into work every day and be in a building with great people, be in a building with great players, um, you know, and to tell those guys, you know, you just got to enjoy it. Like you get to do this. You don't have to do this. Um, I think is the mindset that I take where, you know, I re really enjoy this profession from that standpoint. We, we talked to coach Barton uh, last week and he was talking about how he's maybe just now realizing to maybe enjoy the journey and, and realize that it can be fun compared to you know, being a little bit more of a, of a, I don't know, hard headed or uh, more rigid in terms of like what he's asking for. So it's a, uh, it's definitely an interesting uh, dynamic when you're talking about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think, uh, you know, just loving every moment of it, you know, loving every moment of it is something that I, I've been fortunate enough to work with some guys that I learned early on, um, you know, where it's it, it really is a blessing to do this and, and to work with a great, especially when you got a great staff and, and great individuals in the building. When you look at a, the safety position itself, you know, what do you look for in a good safety? You know, again, I think you want those three pillars that we just talked about, you know, being a guy who competes um, and you can see it on the field. You know, you can see it when when guys are hungry 
and they're they're wired the right way. Um, you know, we'll use a term on the defense of junkyard dogs, you know, where they're going to get after it. They're going to bite, scratch and claw to do whatever they have to do um, to put somebody on the ground when it comes to tackling. You want to see fundamentals in terms of block destruction, but um, that's all stuff we can teach. It's it's the wiring. Are they wired right? You know, can they run somebody down, put them on the ground, make a game changing play when the ball's in the air? Um, are a couple things that we're looking for, you know, all the time. Coach, uh, we, we I didn't quite hear the name right, but you have a hybrid safety. Is is it called a thud or a stud? The stud, yeah, yeah, stud, the stud. Yeah. Yep. Okay, yep, the stud. so 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 um, I I can't imagine these competitive guys don't want that name. Um, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, what what what? How I guess what are you looking for in a stud? But more, um. <laughs> That's a funny way to say it. Um, but also, um, like, how does coaching those studs differ from the studs at the other positions? Yeah. Uh, you know, so the stud is, is some to some people in some systems like uh, similar to a nickel corner, um, but but they can be flexible. You know, those guys could could come from Coach Sumler's room. They could come from my room. They're going to yeah. be a little different, maybe a little more coverability. Um in that sense, uh, to play that position, because you're you're going to be on a slot uh, a fair amount. Um, where it differs, uh, maybe a little less in the run fit with the with the two in the back with our free and our rover. Um, but I think the thing with the system is there's so much position flexibility with that guy. Uh, yeah. You know, he can play. If you got a guy that can play stud, they may also be able to play walk back and play free. Um, here and there, you know, so there's going to be some stuff where they're, they're a little more coverability, uh, and a blend between a safety and a corner. Um, mm -hmm. and then there's some packages when you get into some bigger stuff where, you know, we may sub a bigger body out there, um, depending on what we're getting and, uh, and put them a little more closer to the box in the run fit. And, um, I, I think you, you just explained all of that, but if we're looking back, um, I was looking at my next question. If we're looking back, um, you know, on this year and, and, you know, we're doing the same conversation here and it's, you know, January of um, 25 and you're reflecting on 2024 and you're able to say that you did a great job as a position coach. What, what do you think are those things that you would have done? In terms of the reflection? Yeah. In terms of reflection or, and obviously looking forward, what, what is it that you need to do to make sure that you do an excellent job? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, developing and getting getting a, a true two deep ready across the board um, with our guys where the entire room understands what all three positions are doing, where we do have some position flexibility. I'd say, you know, with with the bodies in the room, um, you know, would love guys to be competing for the uh, the all conference accolades between all three positions, you know, because um, I, I think that's when you look back on it when other teams are are voting, when writers are voting, when people are putting the tape on and saying, you know, what's a strong suit of the defense? What obviously love is the safeties coach for people to say, those safeties play harder than anyone we've seen. They play more physical than anyone we've ever seen. And then they're some of the most productive players that we see on the tape. And their tape just jumps off in terms of their speed of play, which talks to them understanding what they're doing. You know, what's interesting is like Paul and I, at least for the last few years, we've been covering the team. We would always talk about how the previous safety coach had the easiest and the toughest job because the safety room was so loaded with, the, you know, three, four deep level of talent. And, you know, how is he going to play those guys? And it feels like even though there was a lot of turnover, that that's still the case. Do you kind of look at it that way that like you're walking into a position where there's a lot of talent uh, and in a way it makes your job easy, but in a way it makes it hard to try to figure out who are those guys that are going to be getting on the field. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, it's definitely a, a, a full room for sure. Um, and to your point, obviously, we, you know, we want to put the best 11 on the field and, and then when you're getting into beyond 11 and it's like, Hey, we got to find a role for this guy or get somebody else on the field. Um, you know, it makes it difficult, but it also makes it easy because, you know, as the season grows on um, and you play into 
the the longer months uh, that you want to play in, obviously, at a place like here, um, you know, you're going to have to build depth and take mm -hmm. some reps off of guys just to continue to keep everybody healthy and keep everybody fresh. So we're all playing um, to the best of our ability. But but no doubt it's it's one of those things where you love you love having the, having some depth. Um, and then it's like a struggle to be like, gosh, we got to find find some roles for different guys and get them get them on the field, which is great. Uh, but you can only play with 11 and only three from our room, obviously. Yeah, Coach, thank you for your time. Uh, it was great uh, talking to you for the first time and hope to uh, chat with you uh, again soon. Yeah, I look forward to uh, meeting you guys in person. But but thanks for having me. Uh, have a blessed day and look forward to it down the road. Thanks, right, have a good one. Welcome back, guys. Paul, that was our interview with the safeties coach C.J. Magorisk. Uh, it's his first position coach opportunity. Uh, he's excited about that. What was your overall take on our conversation with him? I'll be honest with you. I'm a little bit relieved. Um, we've obviously been doing this media thing now for a while. I think this is the fourth or fifth year covering San Diego State football for me. And, um, you know, when you go and you look online for articles about C.J. Magoris, there is not a lot. There's a really cool article that like his local uh, one of the local groups from him growing up about the fact that he was playing in the national championship at uh, coaching in it, I should say. Um, but aside from that, there's just not a lot. And so like I had to go and like do the research and do the work and and all that kind of stuff. And you just you realize I realize as I'm writing it, like this is this is one of the first ones that's been written about him. And so it just feels like, man, I want to do a good job. Um, and we, we want to do a great job and everything, but sometimes I don't always feel that pressure, you know, um, but I felt it with him. And so I wanted to make sure that like, if, if there was a stone that I could get access to, like, I wanted to make sure that I could figure out all the things. So then from the article to the interview, and now the conversation here, um, you know, had a chance to talk to CJ a couple of times since, um, and, um, I'm just really happy with our work, man. And then, so to be truthful, that was like the first thing I was like, I feel a little bit like, ah, like an XL because, you know, you want to do a great job um, because it's a great story. I saw the great story and the the pressure to get it right, but also because of just the timing and how many there have been written and there'll be plenty written about him more. Um, but, but to be able to kind of kick off that, that, the idea of him, especially at San Diego State, man, it was a privilege and I really enjoyed it. Yeah, you have to look at it from a perspective of Coach Eric Schmidt, right? He brought him over from Washington because he saw what he did over there mm -hmm. as, a, as, a, as a GA or an analyst and saw the potential in him to be more than that. And uh, he obviously trusted uh, Coach Magoris. M Coach Magoris trusted Coach Schmidt, and now he's here. So he's got that continuity, at least with the defensive coordinator, to help him in that transition he's coached he's been in the mountain west before right he's been up that that team up north uh <laughs> before uh and so i i think it's a great opportunity for him you know he's got a very talented group of safeties as we've talked about uh every year almost you know they reload uh that group and um uh, i like the things that he's looking for the competitiveness the physicalness uh guys that want to fight and and compete as the things he looks for in a safety. Um, and, you know, he, we talked about this last episode. He mentioned that, hey, the stud could be someone from my group or it could be someone from Demetrius mm -hmm. Summers' group. Right. And as you mentioned, Tavion Beasley, who's listed as a corner, played, you know, stud at the Spring Showcase. So you have to look at it from that perspective that they can be interchangeable and you have to have that um, rapport with Coach Sumler to be able to have that five-man secondary unit. And I think they do. And uh, he's going to have a great opportunity here to show what he can do as a coach. Uh, absolutely. And, and you know, for all of the great things that you want to talk about historically with San Diego State's defense, um, you know, they couldn't tackle last year. And um, it, it was almost, I mean, it, I, 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 the most awkward time in, in all of the press conferences, even, in, you know, when they only went four games, there's a lot of them. But I remember asking that to Cooper McDonald, like really late in the year, like you've been around football a lot. Why can't you all figure out how to tackle? It was basically, I think it probably said a little bit better and nicer, but 
And he just basically said, I don't know. And it was just this like, ah, oh, man, like that's, that's like, nobody has an answer for this. It shouldn't be. They're practicing it. They're doing what they're supposed to be doing. And so I loved his, his answer when talking about, you know, like we have to figure out a way, bite, claw, scratch, be that junkyard dog to get somebody to the ground. And, um, you know, I think the part that didn't quite connect for me when we did the interview until I did the research was just like, that's, that's who he was as a football player. You know, he, he was a, a, a quarterback who has an ACL injury, the second game of his junior season fights all the way back. And in a huge knee brace takes a veer for a touchdown. The first time that they really called his number his senior year. And, and that's what he did. And then, you know, he, he goes and I thought full circle, you know, um, that, that his start amongst being a staff was with Brady Hoke when Brady Hoke was at Michigan and he is the equipment manager and then just realizes this is what I want to do with my life. Like I want to be, this is what I want to do. And so he just goes for it. He competes and he works his ass off and he, um, finds his way to where what you described to where eventually coach Schmidt is going to be able to see that he's continuing in everything that he's done to have this great work ethic and it earned him this job that's here. And I, I think that, um, you know, there is a, I think a well-earned reputation that spread offenses that want to throw the ball around sometimes can lose that grit and they're going to be soft and they're going to be finesse and they're not going to have that edge to them. Um, and I think by having someone like Magorisk on staff, who I think kind of, that's just, that's just what he embodies. That's in everything that he does. Um, I, I think it helps to keep that edge because I, I, I really, um, I have a difficult time believing for all of the, you know, attractiveness of San Diego state of San Diego of playing in a new stadium of, of being a part of these systems with these coaches. I have a difficult time believing that they're ever going to be so much more talented than everybody that they can just roll out the ball and they're going to win. You know what I mean? Like that's ever going to happen. And that, that for them to actually always be good, it's got to be that they got to play as if they are the five, seven quarterback on one and a half legs, um, you know, up in a Detroit, Michigan uh, suburb, you know what I mean? Like they, that's, that's who they have to be all the time. And, and I think their coach, I think their coach coaches from that place. I think McGorris coaches from that place. And, and I think that, you know, for a guy, let's say like um, Deshaun McEwen, who has all of the physical gifts, but has not been able to put it together yet in his career, but has had rave reviews this last year. I think for a guy like McEwen to work underneath Magorisk, and, and if he could give him a little bit of just that, that dog in him, um, I, I think I think it can do wonders for McEwen because then all of the physical gifts that he has for days can 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 come out fully because he's 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 figured out how to how to package that in elite competitiveness. Yeah, I mentioned last episode that I played in the golf tournament on Friday. Well, I ended up getting, I had the privilege of being teamed up with Coach Magoris. Oh, oh, who's a better Shad golfer? He's a better golfer. <laughs> I'm not that far, I wasn't that far off, but right, he right, right, right. consistently, I would say, consistently, we used his ball the most out of our foursome. Okay. All if right. it was a shotgun style, right? Yeah. Um, and so you had to pick one person's ball. I would say out of the four of us, we used his ball the most, although I, it's unofficial, just off of memory. Sure. Uh, and I made it clear I was not a reporter. I was not media that day. It was, uh, I, although I probably had 15 more questions to ask him. But I, 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 you know, I put that to the side. But it was cool to get to know him as a person, not as a coach, but as a person. And uh, really good guy. And I think... Um, it's a great fit for San Diego State, and I think the players are going to like him. They're going to like playing for him. They're going to like being coached by him, and I think he's going to fit. He already has fit into what San Diego State does, so it was really cool to get to at least spend some hours with him on a golf course, right? And uh, uh, it kind of uh, cemented what my thoughts were about him just from this 
you know, 15 minute interview that we had with them a few, few weeks ago. So really cool stuff. Yeah. Um, something that I wasn't able to get into the article um, is there is a podcast on YouTube. So this is not Coach mm -hmm. McCarr's first podcast, um, but there's a podcast. And I think it's like during COVID and um, I'm, I'm forgetting all the details, but, but he goes through, it's a bunch of coaching questions and things like that. A friend of his did it and he was on there for him. And, um, and one of um, the things that he talked about, um, it was just after COVID was like how during he, 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 at one point he was like part of a strength and conditioning staff. Mm. And so he became like really into, they call them, I think Senate Saturdays. And I, and I never got to know, I want to still want to ask him what the heck that is. But I think there were just these videos to try to like get people moving and motivated during um, COVID. And in that podcast, which is really good, so you go listen to it. It's helped me with my research for the article. Um, he talked about juice and he's like, man, we just got to, you have to bring juice. It helps you to bring juice to your day. By, and I, and there was the exact same words that he described with how, how much he's enjoying practice. Cause in practice, he can bring his own juice to yeah. what he's doing. And, and, and so like, I think like, um, that's the other piece of of this whole puzzle. If we're trying to get to know him, which is obviously what this episode is about, you know, he's a motivator. He he is he is he is someone who 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 is explicitly about motivating and and about you know having that joy. I loved how he talked about joy, and I think it's the joy of realizing that, like you know, in terms of his resume, like his playing resume, it isn't much better than yours and mine. Obviously, he had a you know star quarterback and all those kinds of things a little bit better but like he has earned this to be in all of these positions like above his resume obviously i i, I mean that as a player right because he's obviously has a great resume now that he's done as a coach but i think that he brings that joy with him and i think that uh you know the the, the it's cliche but it's true like those guys who they they, they don't have to wake up at five o'clock in the morning to go or six o'clock in the morning or do summer workouts. They don't have to do that. They get to do that. Like there are millions of young people and older people who would love to switch places with them and get that opportunity, you know, with, with what they have at San Diego state. And, and so I love that, that part of his motivation is to bring joy to his players because um, as we talked about um, with uh Zach Barton and how he was saying essentially that is that he doesn't want to be so much looking towards the next thing that he doesn't like enjoy the moment and what's in front of him. And, and so the fact that, you know, um, CJ is so young uh, in his coaching career and in life, but in his coaching career that like he has the wisdom to carry the respect beyond his age, but also the insight to know how to live well. And I think that that has come across and then what, you, what you're saying about, you know, being in that golf tournament with him that you can see in those conversations and the way he carries himself. And as I said, the respect that you can just see, it's obvious to the people around him um, that, you know, I think maybe when Eric Schmidt came and became the defensive coordinator, it was like, he's doing what? He's taking who from Washington? Like what? And I think after all of that, it's like, no, this is the guy that needed to be over here. Like, like, this here he is. This is this was this was a this was a, a this was an all-star hire for a program um that needs to rely on younger coaches in places budgetary wise and all that kind of stuff. Um this is this is a home run hire and and um you know that that has already come across in just a few months. I think it's pretty special. Yeah, this is this is episode 130 of the podcast. Crazy that we made it this far. Let's go. Uh, but it's our sixth position coach uh, or director of player personnel. Uh, I'll call him in that little uh, staff, coach. coaching staff, right? <laughs> there you go. The sixth one we put out over the last couple of weeks. Uh, we've got three more that's already recorded that will come out. Uh, Ryan Lindley, Lanier Sampson, and um, Mike Schmidt, the other Schmidt coach. Mm -hmm. Uh, so those will come out uh, hopefully in the next couple of weeks as well. Uh, so yeah, we're we're almost we recorded these 
these nine interviews in like a week period and we've been kind of filtering them out. And so if you notice certain answers or certain questions might pertain to something that's, you know, about a player that may not be on the team anymore, you know, that's why, you know, these interviews happened uh, at the beginning of spring camp. So keep that in mind as you're listening, but it was really cool um, catching up with uh, Coach Magoras uh, and finding out a little bit about him. And obviously the article you wrote went into much more depth about his background, especially in Michigan and things like that. So really good stuff. I agree. And I, and I, uh, Andre just pulled back the curtain on the fact that we did all of these interviews in like one week and Andre and I have just been spouting off like we have great insight and it's just because no one else has heard the interviews. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Wow. How did we know that about the team? And I'm like, well, <laughs> we cheated. This is yeah, like, no, that's true. That's true. It's like, <laughs> has that interview already come out and have people actually heard that one? Or, yeah, or do, yeah, are we the yeah. only two people that know that? Yeah. <laughs> that's pretty cool. Yeah. Guys, thank you as always for listening, um, liking, subscribing, sharing, following, we really appreciate it. Uh, if you haven't already followed or hit the subscribe button on YouTube, uh, please do so. It definitely helps get our podcast a little higher up in the algorithm and in the search functions and things like yep. that. So definitely uh, hit the subscribe button uh, and tell your friends to subscribe if you haven't already. Uh, and we'll talk to you guys next time. Listening to the SDSU podcast presented by the East Village Times with your hosts Andre Hagverdian and Paul Garrison.